We're going to go into our message uh, this afternoon. It's going to be taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Where the Apostle Paul tells us we shall not all sleep because he's going to show us a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And we're going to talk about what's awaiting us. What's awaiting us? What is our future? What is the result? How does this all end up? Where do we go? All of that type of thing. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And of course, he's talking about glory, being glorified, having resurrected in new bodies that will never die. There will be no more death, no crying. Neither shall there be any sorrow nor any more pain. The former things will pass away. And our body, that new body will be like Christ's resurrected body. That's what it says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. It says, he shall change our vile bodies, that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Amen. According to the working whereby he is able, able to subdue all things unto himself. And not only that, he tells us that we're going to be raised up and we're going to be raised up immortal and imperishable. And imperishable. Now Paul uses that term mystery here. And oftentimes when you're trying to interpret scripture and you have people talking, they'll say, you know, what is that? What is a mystery? A mystery in the scripture is something that is heretofore not known, but it was made revealed at that time. It was something that God had spoken of, but it's something that he remained, he didn't tell you what it meant. He didn't tell you what it was until a certain point in time. Now he's revealing it. And Paul is revealing that this would happen. Now, all of this is based upon the resurrection, because if there's no resurrection, there's no hope. That's it. It's all over. There's no hope for anybody. I don't care how happy you are, and I don't care what religion you go to or what religion you fabricate. There is no hope. If Christ is not risen, our faith is vain. That's what he says. Our preaching is vain. He says, you are yet in your sins. The sin factor is there, no matter what. If there is no hope, you're just all stuck in your sins. And everybody who's a sinner who doesn't claim to be a, not, a person of Christ is going to be in sins as well. So professing believers are lost and unprofessing people are lost as well. There is no alternative hope. And this is what God does. He makes things very emphatic. He doesn't say, if you don't believe in Christ, then here's another way and I'll accept it. He doesn't say that. And this is why so many people have a problem with the biblical God. He doesn't give you all of those alternatives that you seek. He doesn't give you all those other ways of thinking. And this world wants alternatives. And they claim if God doesn't give it to them, he's not God, which makes no sense, but that's the way they think. And certainly God gives you no other option because he's the only God there is. He's the only God who ever has been or ever will be again, according to Isaiah 43, verses 10 and 11. He is the one God and there's no other. Paul says, for though there be gods many and lords many in terms of people's minds, yet to us there is but one God, the Father of all, by whom are all things and one Lord Jesus Christ, in whom are all things. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. So when we look here, we're going to see something very amazing here. When Christ died, he ratified everything in the Bible, and he ratified the future. And that's why Paul speaks the way he does. And as we went on our Sunday school lesson, we saw some interesting things. When you look at it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12, he says, Now if it be preached that Christ rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Clearly, there were some in the church that already did not believe in a future resurrection. And already in the first century when they were preaching Christ being raised from the very beginning. And what they were saying is that we believe Christ rose, but we don't believe there's going to be a future resurrection. The Sadducees were the Jewish group that didn't believe in a resurrection. They believed that was silly. They didn't believe in any hope for the future. And this is how atheists and people of that ilk feel today. They feel like there is no future. This is all there is. Don't worry about it. Just accept it and do what you can. But that's not it at all. There is a future. And there is an accountability for those that don't believe. They're going to have to be resurrected and stand before the Lord too. Everybody's going to have to give an account. Believers and unbelievers alike are going to stand before God. It's just that the judgments are going to be totally different. For a believer, those who expect, accepted Christ, they don't have to stand on their own works. They don't have to worry about God saying, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. But those who have never stood for Christ, they will have that happen. They're going to have all the works that they have ever done. It's going to be told them. It's going to be there. God is going to have the record. All the angels are keeping all the records now. And the books are going to be open. And it says, whoever was not found written in the book of life 
was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 14 and 15. So if your name is not in the Lamb's book of life, you have no life. Your future is the lake of fire where Satan himself will be thrown. That's very clear. So you have to make sure your name is in the Lamb's book of life. <clears throat> not on the history record of how you made it here, or how people honor you here, or what religion you were here. That's irrelevant. You're going to have to stand before the Lord, and his Lamb's book of life is the record of all of those whose names are written because they trusted Jesus Christ as Lord. They simply believe the truth of what God has established and what he's historically made clear, that Christ alone is Lord. So if there's no resurrection in the future, Paul says, then you're saying Christ never rose in the past. And if Christ never rose, your faith is vain, and all of this is vain. All of our preaching is vain. All of our faith is vain. There is no hope. You are yet in your sins. Because the future is hinged on the past. If Christ did rise in the past, there is definitely a resurrection in the future. You see, God owns the future. And people don't believe that, but he does. And the fact that he made something ratified in the past shows that the future will be clear. There must be a resurrection in the future because there was a resurrection in the past. And that resurrection will be unto life for those who believe and a resurrection unto death that those don't. But there will be a resurrection. And Paul makes that emphatically clear. And if there is no resurrection, everything about the Bible has always been a lie. But if there is a resurrection, and if Christ did rise, everything about God is true. You see, when you're dealing with atheists, you don't have to go through all the riffraff. They'll come up with a million contradictions that they think are in the Bible. They'll come up with all these little fabrications and tell you to try to answer. All you have to do is state that Christ rose. And if Christ rose, all of what they're saying means nothing. And certainly over 21 centuries, all of the evidence is that he rose. But it's very fascinating, all the theories that people have come up with. We were talking about some of them in men's Bible study. Now, this is what scholars have come up with to try to undermine the resurrection. <clears throat> There's one theory called the swoon theory. That's Jesus never died. He was just beaten so bad, he fainted. And in that, they thought he was dead, and they put him in the tomb. Then after three days, he woke up and said, hmm, what am I doing in here? And then he rolled away the stone and walked out, and we haven't seen him since. That's the swoon theory. Now, these are scholars making this up. And then we have other theories as well. We have the twin brother theory, that Jesus never died. He just had an identical twin we didn't know about. And his identical twin was the one that died, and Jesus went about his business. We just haven't found him since either. Then there's the drug-induced theory. That is that they had this drug back then that they snuck up on Jesus before all of the pain of the crucifixion to help dull in the pain. So he never really died because those drugs helped him get through it and he walked away somehow and we haven't seen him since. Now these are scholarly theories as alternatives to the resurrection. No basis in fact, they don't even make common sense of any kind. And yet they will try to push it. Why? Because it's so important that Christ did not rise. Because if Christ rose, everybody who doesn't believe him is wrong. And they're lost and they know it. And they know there is no hope without him. Because Christ has clearly said, without me you can do nothing. And he says, if you don't believe in me, you have no hope. He that is, uh, believes in the Son has life, and he that has not the Son has not life. 1 John 5, 12, there is no other alternative. And the fact that Christ stands on no alternative except him, and the fact that the Bible stands that way, is why it's offensive to this generation. They are looking for alternatives. They're looking for something to believe and hold as true that's not true. And yet they want to say the Bible is a myth. They want to say the Bible is legend. They want to say Jesus really wasn't who he said he was. Now they can't say he didn't live because it's too well recorded. They can't say he didn't die because that's also recorded. They can't even say he wasn't crucified because that's also recorded, even though they still attempt to do that. But what they try to say is that he really wasn't the son of God. Really, people made him out to be something more than he was. Really, he didn't rise from the dead, even though there was an empty tomb from day one. And even though the early preaching in the church was from Jerusalem, the very place where he was executed, the very public area where they could have easily gone and said, here he is, we found a body. They could have even come up with somebody and put them and made them look like Jesus. They couldn't do it. And he preached to the very Jews. They were the first ones to receive the gospel. The Jews that wanted Pilate to crucify him were the first ones to receive the message. On the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and he said, you have taken him and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. But God has raised him from the dead. He preached resurrection to the very Jews who hated the Lord Christ. And that's why they did so much to try to persecute the Christians. 
They knew the story was real. They just tried to snuff it. They couldn't say it wasn't true. They just tried to make it so it could not be spread. So it was not the fact that they overwhelmed truth. They just tried to silence it. But today, we're even more creative. We try to act like truth never occurred. Yes, we're really progressive in the 21st century. We're not even on the level of the Pharisees and Sadducees of the first century. They knew what was true. They just tried to lie and cover it up. We try to say it's not true, and that becomes our lie. But the historical facts are clear. He died under Pontius Pilate. He died in the reign of Tiberius Caesar. It's recorded. He was crucified. He died, though, not in vain. He died according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, that's what Paul says. He died according to the scriptures and he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and he was seen of Cephas. That's Peter from John 142. That's the name Jesus gave him. Then he was seen of the 12. Some people say, uh huh, that got to be a lie because there weren't 12. Judas hung himself. But there was always a 12th position and we know that Mattathias ended up taking in Acts chapter 1. And not only that, he was seen of above 500 Christians at the same time. And he mentions them. He says, most of them are still alive when I'm writing this. Some of them have passed on. Then after that, he was seen of James, the Lord's brother. And uh, Josephus, one of the most, the major Jewish historian, we get a lot of this, says James was an extremely righteous man. And he really felt like the Roman Jewish conflict was based upon the fact that they killed James, the Lord's brother. He said that man was so righteous. Josephus, who was a historian, he said that I think that the Roman war came against the Jews and the temple was destroyed because of what they did to James. That's his own testimony. One of the most reliable historians we have. And that was the Lord's brother. And then Paul says, last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. What did Paul mean? I never met the Lord directly, and I didn't believe in him in this life. But it was after he had already died and rose, and he had resurrected, and he was already in the right hand of God. And I was on my way to Damascus to persecute more Christians. I got letters. I had the power. I had the legislator behind me. And I was driving there, and I had six men with me. And we were going to take as many bound to Jerusalem, bring them back. Didn't care whether they were men and women, boys or girls. Bring them back bound and put them on trial. And while we were there, it was around noontime, and then all of a sudden a light shined. Now, if God wants to shine a light, you put a little candle in the dark, and that way you think it's some apparition. But no, you don't shine a light in noonday when the sun's already high. But there was a light that shined, and it was so bright, it knocked him off of his beast. The men who were with him, they heard something, but they didn't hear directly what went down. They saw something, but they didn't see exactly what went down. But Paul saw it. And God says, Paul, Paul, he says, who are they? He said, who are you, Lord? Why are you persecuting me? He called him by his old name, Saul. He said, it is hard for you to kick against the pricks. And Paul says, Lord, what will you have me to do? That's what he meant. I'm as one born out of due time. I saw the Lord after his resurrection, but I saw him. And Paul was so moved by this vision, he didn't go to the apostles to try to check it out. He said he went into Arabia. And then after that, he went back to Damascus and he began preaching. And from that point, he never stopped. That's very clear. And that's very true. Paul continued to preach Christ. And they were so persuaded in the resurrection, it was no point in fearing death to the point that they were willing to die. And they did die. The massive persecutions of the first three centuries are incredible. And the amount of Christians that were killed in all types of ways and all types of means were incredible because they were so persuaded that Christ rose, that it was worth going through the torture. And I'm talking about not just old people. I'm talking about young people, young women with children, little babies, everybody killed and massacred. And yet they went. I guess all of them were crazy. I guess all of them believed in the swoon theory. I guess all of them believed in the twin theory. No, these were normal people. But these were people whose lives were changed and so persuaded that life to come is better than life here, that they were willing to suffer whatever came here in order to meet it. But they weren't crazy folk. You know, some people that believe in the future life are crazy. They start doing all types of weird things here. No, these were normal people. The resurrection was there, and they knew it, and they were fully persuaded of it. Now, what do we have to come? Because Christ did rise. We know what's going to happen. He says, flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Now, think about this, people. If God is going to give you life, and you're already born in sin and shaping in iniquity, is it a hard thing to believe that he can raise you up and have eternal life where you won't have any sin? Certainly, the latter is more realizable than the former. If God is going to give you life knowing you're going to sin, then certainly God can resurrect you knowing you won't sin. Certainly, the latter is more truer of what God would do. And so God is telling us this is going to happen. And he says, flesh and blood will not inherit. You can't. 
because flesh and blood is temporal and because flesh and blood sins. Paul says, I know that in me that is in my body dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I don't find. Romans 7, 18. He tells us that inside, sin has so corrupted us that even the best of us are still tainted by it. We're still corrupted by it and we can't break it. We can't break its power. But the resurrection will break its power. Because in trusting Christ, Christ will do it for you. Now since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. That's exactly right. Christ became man in order to conquer the power of death, in order that we would be free from its power, because death has a sting to it. You can be shot and not hardly feel anything and go into eternity, but that's not the sting. You can be cut and you can have your aorta severed and you can go into death and probably hardly ever feel a thing, but death still has a sting to it. What stings about death is that you're a sinner and it's going to hold you forever. It's going to torment you forever. That's the sting of death. We're not talking about just dying physically here. Everybody says, I'm not afraid to die. You don't understand what death is. You simply think that you stop ceasing to exist. That's not death. Death is when you're tormented because your soul is now in a place that is separate from God, full of darkness, full of fire, and there is no freedom of relief from. That's what death really is. That's the fear, and it has sting. And that sting will keep you. But Jesus has removed the sting of death. It no longer stings. How do I know that? Isaiah 25, 11, who wrote seven centuries before. He said, death is swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up. Oh, death, where is your sting? And that's what Paul is about to get to here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We shall not all sleep. That means we shall not all physically die that believe. But we all shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, O oh, death! Where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. When you sin, it's going to cause a sting, and the law is only going to condemn you more because it's going to show all the law of God you broke. But Christ gives us the victory. In Christ Jesus, he removes the, sin, the sting of sin. Therefore, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your work is not in vain in the Lord. Now you're to activate now, immediately doing the things that please God. Because your hope is in the resurrection to come. Your hope is in everything that God has said will come by virtue of what you presently do here now. That's the Bible's teaching. If we be dead with him, we shall future live for him. If we suffer, we shall future reign with him. If we deny him, he also in the future will deny us. So the future is settled for those who already know how to live in the present. And for those that believe that Christ rose, they live a resurrection every day. They also live a crucifixion every day. What are you talking about, preacher? Well, crucifixion is part of our life. The way we know we live for God is how we're crucified in the flesh presently. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. What does he mean? Everything I do is based upon my confidence in the Lord. It shows up the things I do well, but it also shows up the things I don't do well. And when I do wrong, it compels me to have to confess to Christ. It compels me to have to turn from them in order that I be in Christ. It's sort of like what happened to Peter. When Christ said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. Peter said, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. That's what he was saying. If that's what it's going to mean, let me drop it right now like a hot potato. Let me change my ways immediately. And that's what God wants in the spirit of all of his children, to follow him. And it will show up when you fall short. But when you fall short, you won't say, oh, it's all right. God expects us as humans to fall a little bit. God expects us to be what we are. He understands. That's the kind of spirit that is taking this age over. That's a wrong thinking. That sin is an acceptable way of God. That somehow when you sin, it's okay because he still loves you. And after all, if you sin, he doesn't expect anything different because after all, he knows your weaknesses. Therefore, it's all right to sin. Wrong answer. Wrong answer, but it's a way many people think. It's a spirit of doubt that is part of this way, and it makes people think that they're saved and they're not. I want you to understand very carefully. In Matthew chapter 7, he says, Many will say unto thee that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name have cast out demons and done many wonderful works. And he says, Then will I profess unto them in verse 23, 
I never knew you depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Many professed church people will go straight to hell. They will have never been part of God's kingdom because their thinking has been that thwarted. It's been that distorted. It has been that misapprehended. It's been misapprehended because it hasn't looked at what God is saying. When you're a Christian, you look at what God has said and you measure yourself according to what God has said. You don't say when you fall short, God changes his program to fit me. That's the wrong way. That's the deceived way. The right way is saying this is wrong and I know what to pray for. You got to be like that publican who came and would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he smote upon his breast and said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. It's not that you accept sin. It's that you know sin is not acceptable, but you cry out to God because of it. You cry out for mercy because you know it's not acceptable. We live in an age where sin is supposed to be acceptable. You've got churches proclaiming. You've got people going to church believing it. And it's wrong because it's never what God says. But if you have weaknesses and if you have problems, and if you have difficulties, there's not one that Christ can't go overcome. Not one. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Name them. Name the big ones. Nay, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter in all things. He says, we're more than conquerors. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus the Lord. But Paul talked about others, and they had others that died and went on that believed in the Lord. What's going to happen to them? Because when you die, you have no power over yourself. In fact, to tell you the truth, when you're alive, you don't have any power over yourself. What you have is what God gives you, but it's not ultimate power. You recognize God gives you every breath. God gives you every heartbeat. It tells us that all things are before him and he is by all things he causes them to consist. In Colossians 1.17, that means God is keeping everything running. And as soon as he says no, you're out of there. It doesn't matter what you do. But certainly you will see that there will come a time when all of those who are in Christ, and Paul says comfort one another. For those who had dead ones that believed, they wondered if they were going to be part of the celebration when Christ returned. What's going to happen to them? And Paul says, listen, I want you to not sorrow as others which have no hope. We have hope, and our hope is a certain hope. If you believe, the hope is certain. The question is whether you will believe. You see, all the if is over here. That's why you want to live your life in a way that there's no uncertainty as to where you're going, as to who you're worshiping. I hate preaching funerals where you can't tell where a person's going. I hate it. Everybody wants to say they were good and they're going to heaven, but their lives don't indicate it. This world is full of people whose lives don't indicate what their lips say they're doing. They say they love Jesus, but their lives don't indicate it. And how they get that assurance, I don't know, but I'll tell you where it doesn't come. It doesn't come from God's word. God's word does not give you the assurance you're going to heaven when you're living like you're doing everything wrong. It will tell you you'll be broken. It will tell you there's forgiveness if you turn, but it will not allow you to be acceptable on that basis. But Paul says, listen, for those who sleep, don't sorrow as others that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, that's today, people. We celebrate the fact that he has risen. If we believe Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. You remember the teachings of Jesus? He says not one of them shall be lost. Didn't he say that? He said, I will raise him up at the last day, but those that hear me and see the Son and believe on him, none of them shall be lost. Well, none of them are lost. All loved ones who have died, it doesn't matter whether they died today or whether they died 20 years ago or two centuries ago. They're all there with him. All of them are there with him. And when he comes from heaven, it says the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. He's bringing them with him. He descends out of heaven. And those that are alive, because there'll be some surviving believers when he returns, those that are alive are not going to stop the ones who've died. In other words, the ones who have died are going to beat you there. They're going to be there quicker than you get there. If you think they're lost, listen carefully. He says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. It's always the first shall be last and the last first. The dead in Christ shall rise first. What does that mean? He brings their souls with him when he descends. They unite with their old bodies that have been rotted in the grave. God changes those old bodies and makes them glorious bodies like Christ. And then they come back up with those resurrected bodies. They've been in heaven all that time, but they never had the resurrected body. Can you imagine being in heaven, being in the glory of God, and yet when you get your resurrected body, it's even better? They get their resurrected bodies, and then all of a sudden, they're immediately up in the air. 
The ones that are alive are going to be changed. That's why he says the corruptible shall put on incorruption. Those are the ones in the grave. The mortal, those are the live ones. They're alive when he comes, but flesh and blood can't go to heaven. He can't take you up the way you are. You've got to be changed. So this mortal must put on immortality. Then the ones who are alive are going to be changed. Now all of this is going to happen within a twinkling of an eye. It's just that the dead are going to be quicker than your twinkling. They're going to get up there faster in that twinkle than the live ones. But all of it's going to happen in such a blink. And then you're going to see them in the air. You're going to see them. This is the only place that Paul says it, that your saints are going to meet the Lord in the air. Not in heaven, not on earth, but in the air. In the air, midway, coming down. They all meet up, and wherever they are from that point, he says, so shall you ever be with the Lord. I'm looking forward to that day. And every time you have to suffer to overcome sin, and every time you have to suffer because others are trying to persecute you because you're living right, just remember the resurrection is coming. Just get a little smile and say, I'm looking forward to it. It's coming as a twinkling in an eye, and it'll all be over. You see, when you're suffering, it looks like it'll never be over. When you look at things, it looks like it'll never end. People say, oh man, revelation must be a far way off. Look at all the prophecies that have to be fulfilled. You don't understand. When God moves, it happens real quick. It seems to take forever, but once he moves, it happens like lightning. He moves real fast once he starts it going. And in the scheme of things, you have to be ready real quick or else you'll be left behind. If you think you have 400 years, you're going to sit on your laurels. And 400 years will happen like that. In terms of your spiritual readiness, you got to move fast and you got to move now. You see, that's why I'm telling people, you're living in a country where everybody thinks they're all right. They think Christianity is extra. They think going to church is extra. They think doing anything for God is extra. They're wrong in their understanding. They don't realize that God is giving them an opportunity to eternal life. And you've got to press your way into the kingdom. You've got to fight to get in there. You've got to make sure you get rid of all those attitudes that tell you you don't have to fight, that you don't have to struggle, that you don't have to struggle against sin to get there. They say, well, we live by grace and grace is not work. I'm not talking about the works that you use to substitute faith. When you try to say by works, you think you're all right. You, you're all right on your own. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about grace is offered you so you can fight sin. And you have to fight sin in order to make sure that grace is applied. I'm talking about people who will not fail of God's grace. Many people will not make it to heaven. And it's not because God's grace didn't come. I refuse to understand the, or accept the Calvinistic notion that faith is only granted to some. The opportunity for faith is granted to all. It's just that some refuse that opportunity. And because they refuse it, that's what's going to seal their fate. Do you know how Judas died? Judas didn't die because God didn't give him an opportunity. Judas didn't die because he didn't have an opportunity to be a great apostle. Jesus himself said in John 6, 70, he says, have I not chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil? He had the greatest opportunity. And the fact that he turned from it is why Jesus said it was good for that man had he not been born. That's what makes your life vague. To have grace and to snuff it. To have grace and to ignore it. To have grace and to look down upon it. To have grace and to not move on it. If there's ever going to be revival, it's going to have to be where people's hearts are willing to move when God speaks. It's going to have to be people whose hearts have been humbled to recognize the true position they're in and not to feel as though they're all right and God's got to meet them on their terms. It's going to have to be when people are so shaken that the power of God has to be more important than their daily concerns. It takes power to get you to heaven. It takes power to change that soul that is comfortable into a soul that is willing to do anything for Christ and see it as something good and not as something wrong. And that's where Paul changed. He recognized that and he says every Christian has to think like that. He says, don't we all run in a race, but only one receives the prize. He says, you have to so run that you might obtain. Run just like you're in an Olympic race and you got to beat out Usain Bolt. Run like you got to beat out all of them. Run like you got to beat out the current hurdler. When you're running the Christian race, God frees you. But the fact that he frees you means you got to be used that freedom for him. Just like he used all of his freedom to say, I'm not going to stay up in heaven. I'm not going to stay in the glory of the splendor that I love. I'm going to go down in a body and I'm going to give up my divine prerogatives. I'm going to be down there for 33 and a half years. And when things get hard and I still remember the way glory was, I'm not going to say I'm sorry. I'm not going to say I repent for having come. I'm not going to say it. I'm still going to turn and not come back. I'm going to go all the way and I'm not going to turn back till it's finished. You've got to understand that once Christ made that commitment to leave glory, he was never going to get back till he went all the way. He was never going to get back until he fulfilled everything. 
He made a commitment. I can't get back. That's why at the end, in John 17, 4, he says, Father, I've done what you wanted me to do. I've finished my work. Now, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory I had with you before the world was. Put me back. Put me back. But he wasn't going back. And I'm telling you, you can't go back to your life. You can't go back to your world. You've got to fight those tendencies. You can't go back. He says in Luke 9, 62, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. And oftentimes we live back and just claim Jesus. No, you've got to change. You've got to change. I guess this is why so few make it in the light of how so many people have the opportunity. But you preach, hopefully, that everybody take advantage of the opportunity as opposed to simply ignore it. But you can't help what they do, but you can preach with the power to allow God to shake them up, to let them realize what they have to do. Every time someone heard Jesus preach or they heard John preach, they would ask the question, what must I do? What must I do? We preach grace to the extent that people don't think they have to do anything. And that's not grace. Grace is God's free gift. But apprehending that gift means that you love him the way he loved you. And people don't use that effort. And they don't take that mantle upon them. Paul says, I've got to take that mantle. Otherwise, I can never say I love Christ the way he loved me. I'm fighting to be like him. I'm not fighting to be on some low level and get in. He says, I don't count myself to have apprehended. This one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind. I reach toward those things that are before. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean you're not saved. That's how you prove you're saved. When you're saved, that's the mentality you develop. When you're saved, that's the mentality you go by. You're reaching to be like Jesus. The Bible wants us conformed to the image of Christ, Romans 8, 29. He wants you to always fulfill those good works which he's always ordained for you in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Adam brought in sin and Christ brought it out. The first one was Adam. The first man was Adam. He was made of what? He brought sin into the world, but the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. And all the way from Adam, and then Adam's son Seth and Enos and Cain and Mahalalel and Jared and Enoch. And then after Enoch, there was what? There was Methuselah who had Lamech who had Noah. Shem, Ham, and Japheth were the three sons. Shem had a poxide who had Selah, who had Eber, who had Peleg, who had Reu, who had Sarah, who had Nahor, who had Terah, who had Abram. Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees and he had Isaac when he was 100 years old. Isaac had Jacob and Jacob had his 12 sons, but it was through that fourth son Judah through whom the Messiah would come. Judah had Pharaoh, who had Ezra, who had Aram, who had Aminadab, who had Nation, who had Solomon, who had Boaz, who had Obed, who had Jesse, who had David the king. David the king had Solomon of her who had been the wife of Uriah. And Solomon had Rehoboam, who had Abijah, who had Asa, who had Jehoshaphat, who had Joram. And then after that, you end up seeing uh, Ahaziah and Joash and Amaziah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Amon. And then good king Josiah. And Josiah had Jeconias and his brother when they were carried into the Babylonian captivity in 587 B.C. as the last deportation. And then when they were brought to Babylon, he had Salathiel, who had Zerubbabel, who had Abiad, who had Eliakim, who had Azor, who had Achim, who had Eliad, who had Eleazar, who had Mathan, who had Jacob, who had Joseph, who was the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus. Now when Adam came into the world, he was the only one around. He was the only one around, but he was the king of Eden. When Christ came into the world, he wasn't the king of anything, but he was the son of God. But he was the king, wasn't he? He was the king of the universe, but he came in as a carpenter's son. And do you know people got offended? They saw the miraculous works of his hands. They said, isn't this Joseph and Mary's boy? Isn't his brothers with us? How does he do these mighty works? And the fact that he did mighty works coming as a carpenter offended them. They were offended that God would show his mighty works under such lowly conditions. That's why people are so lost. They don't understand the heart of God to sit high and to reach low. God purposely goes down in order to lift you up. And he's got to go down pretty far because there's some people that are pretty low. But God goes down far enough to make sure everybody can come up. The worst of sinners, the murderers of fathers, the murderers of mothers, the manslayers, the whoremongers, the adulterers, the liars, the sorcerers, all of them who will have part in the lake of fire. Jesus came in for and he took all of the law that they had broken and put it upon him. And now he said, he that believes in me and follows my commandments shall be saved. And those who see Christ as a forerunner, and there was one of them. You know the first word when Jesus was on the cross in Luke 23, 34? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And you know we preach that story of that man on the cross, that thief that somehow those words changed him while he was there nailed and the blood had been running out. 
And he heard Jesus say that, and all of a sudden, he turned to the other thief. And he says, don't you know that we're in the same condemnation? We're worth it. We have done these things, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he looked at him and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, this day shall you be with me in paradise. And then the 11th hour, that man's soul was changed. That's why we preach. I don't know where the 12th hour is coming, but it's coming soon. But you better preach all the way up. You better preach up to 11.59 and 59 seconds. You better preach all the way up to the moment, till that last hour comes, because whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts chapter 2, verse 21. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that the wonderful grace of God that in the last hour the worst of sinners can come and be in paradise? And not paradise only. When Christ descended, he also ascended up out of that. And he sat at the right hand of God. You saw that there were some saints that rose up after his resurrection to show the power of God. These saints didn't go with him into heaven, but it was to show the power of the resurrection. They resuscitated, but they died again, but they were going to be resurrected in the last days. But certainly when Christ went back to the right hand of God, whoever now believes goes straight to be where the Lord is. They go straight to be in the presence of the Lord. That's why Paul says, I'm in a straight betwixt two. I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. In other words, if he had to wait, it wouldn't be a, a, a problem. But he knows he can go straight there. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Think like that, people. Think like that and live for the Lord. So when death comes knocking, it's a gain and not a reproach. It's a gain and something you don't have to shake your head with him. Too many people don't see Christ as who he is, and so they think they can stand. But you can't stand his coming any more than the Jews and Pharisees could stand it when he came the first time. They were not ready. And in the New Testament age of grace, church folk are not ready for the same reasons. But God is telling you how to get ready and to make sure that your works are in him. And when they fall short, the spirit that is in you will also compel you to seek him for forgiveness. The forgiveness of God and the long-suffering of God is uncanny. I don't know anything it's equal. I don't know how God can love like that and continue to endure to the end and think good thoughts. Not one evil thought. When all of our evil thoughts oftentimes come to him. God is good. Now don't ever compare Buddha. Don't ever bring up Muhammad. Don't ever. I'm not saying that in terms of humanity. But you see, you offend when you start putting them in the class of Jesus. Amen. You see, you don't know what you're talking about. You're in some other universe. The death is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It's sown a natural body, but it's raised the spiritual body. This body must die to bring on the new. But make sure the body that dies is a body that's looking forward to the new in obedience to Christ. And the analogy is everywhere. Everything you sow has to die to bring forth the fruit it brings. The resurrection is just on the highest level. The highest level. And you'll wake up. I used to know this old man in Boston. And I say, how you doing? He said, me, Arthur, and Bertha, fine. I said, what are you talking about? Arthur, arthritis and bursitis. They're always with me. But there'll be a day where that won't be. There'll be a day when your vision will be better than 2020 ever was here. You'll know even as you also are known. And you will be like Christ, for you shall see him as he is. That blows my mind. But it's coming soon. You'll look back on this quicker than you'll look back on your old days and say, man, that was just a few weeks ago. What happened? And it'll come like that. And you'll remember these times. Continue in the faith, grounded and settled. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the mighty and holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, guide us, Lord, and strengthen us according to your mighty power and your Holy Spirit. And also, Lord, persuade us to continue to labor and not to faint and not to give up. And knowing that we labor in the hope of what will happen, that our labor in you is not in vain that all other labor is. So teach us, Lord, to make sure that our labor is in the right way. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let us stand, the doors of the church open.